Hey guys, Roman Jenkins here. Uh, I did one of these a little more recently than I thought, but I wanted to cover a topic that's kind of been in the news a bit and go a little bit more general after that. But I wanted to talk about the RQ-170. Now, for those of you not in the know, uh, Iran shot down, or claims to have shot down, uh, probably it ran out of fuel and crashed, uh, a semi-stealth drone the U.S. military uses called the RQ-170. Now, the RQ-170 is a little bit unique among uh, U.S. military drones in that not a lot's really known about it. Uh, it's still technically classified, though a lot of pictures of it do exist. It was first spotted over Kandahar in 2006 and uh, was promptly nicknamed the Beast of Kandahar, despite the fact that it has maybe a bomb bay. Uh, no one knows for sure if it's used for just reconnaissance or if it's used solely or as a bomber as well. Uh, but it's possible it has a bomb bay. So the RQ-170 is a flying wing design similar to the B-2 stealth bomber and it's painted gray which indicates that it probably flies something below 50,000 feet uh, if not exactly there. Uh, black paint would be much more useful above that level. Uh, like the stealth bomber and like the F-117 Nighthawk which I've covered in the past it is a hopeless diamond configuration, uh, suggesting that the radar absorbing material in the plane body, if there is any, is augmented by the shape of the plane. Uh, but what's interesting about that fact is that it doesn't have the sharp edges you'd expect, and it doesn't really have a full covering of the fan or the exhaust on the TF-36, possibly TF-36 engine which is the same that's used in the A-10 Warthog, uh, or Thunderbolt as it's also known. Uh, this is kind of interesting because it suggests that the plane is not a fully stealth plane, or at the very least has a larger radar profile than you'd expect for what we'd call a stealth craft. Uh, this probably increases its chances of being shot down fairly significantly, but not enough that someone like Iran could take it out easily. So. What also makes it sort of interesting is that it, when, when it was spotted over Afghanistan, it was pretty well known that Afghanistan didn't have the radar capabilities needed to detect anything like that, or really any radar. So the theory goes that it's used mostly to spy over Pakistan and Iran, which makes complete and total sense, uh, considering that it's probably got a decent range and a decent speed and its height is a little bit better than the Predator or the Reaper, which are the two main uh, drones you think of when you think of UAVs in the U.S. military. So it, it's probably got a sensor array in the two hard points underneath the wings, uh, or the two uh, bays or whatever you'd want to call them. Uh, so it probably is used to track Pakistan's nuclear missiles, or Iran's uh, nuclear sites. So that makes it kind of unique. It's used basically to do one task most likely and probably provide some air support or aerial reconnaissance for troops in the field. But when you think of the UAVs uh, that the US military uses, you think of the Reapers and the Predators. These things have been around for a while. We have really only started to use them more constantly in the last few years because with the advent of aerial relays uh, in the U.S. military through AWACS systems, we were able to kind of control them from a distance, not have to have the operators nearby, and they are just amazing craft for what we want to use them for, which is loitering over targets, uh, taking reconnaissance, or using it as sort of a, an advanced team to scout ahead. And the Predator was pretty much designed just for this task. It, it can uh, do what the AC-130 does, which is uh, circle an area constantly, just keep going. Uh, if you're watching this game, you're probably seeing a few of them in the air. Uh, they're just, they're there for reconnaissance. Someone put the idea forward that you could put a couple of missiles on the thing and use it for precision strikes, and that's exactly what happened. And it was such a successful design that they started developing the M9, MQ-9 Reaper, which has a turbofan instead of a prop, 
and it's actually a Pratt and Whitney 100 220 series, I believe, and uh, it's used for reconnaissance, but also as an attack craft, uh, close support for troops and such, and it uses uh, Hellfire missiles. So, with these kind of crafts, we kind of put ourselves ahead of the game in a lot of ways uh, in the countries that the U.S. is entangled in. Uh, that's not to say other countries don't have drones. Iran, for example, has drones. Britain, Germany, France, pretty much every country you can think of develops a drone of some nature. Uh, this is because the basic idea behind a drone is much more accessible to a low-income nation uh, like Iran or something like that, that than developing a new fighter craft. Iran uses F-4 Phantoms from back in the Vietnam era and the Shah's time in office when we were supplying them with military weapons to keep them from becoming a democracy uh, because, you know, we wanted some sweet oil money. So, to, uh, to that point, a lot of countries have developed these systems and it's not like we're the only ones with the capabilities to field drones. It's just that the U.S., with its uh, really ever-presence in the Middle East and around the world, has a much larger demand for them and a much larger uh, or much more technologically advanced versions uh, in the air. Britain is not close behind, or not far behind, I should say. So there are not just loitering and stealth reconnaissance and reconnaissance drones, but there are also fighter drones and bomber drones. Now, the bomber drones are much further ahead than the fighter drones in terms of being usable aircraft and uh, being fielded or made into production craft, uh, simply because bombers are a much easier design to kind of handle. They fly slower, they drop ordnance, you don't have to you put them through insane maneuvers. And that's a really helpful situation to have if you're trying to call in a quick bomb strike. You don't have to wake up the pilots. You don't have to uh, kind of get them ready, go through the systems checks, all that stuff. You can basically put this thing out in the field and run it uh, because it's all automated. And that's really why drones have become so popular. Uh, you don't have the limitations a pilot provides. If you have somebody flying this thing from miles upon miles upon miles away, even halfway across the world, uh, you don't have to worry about G-loading, you don't have to worry, well you do in terms of aircraft design, but in terms of life support systems and pilot uh, ability to function inside a high pressure environment, or well, high G-load environment, let's say, you don't have to worry about that. Part of what makes a lot of fighter jets and bombers so expensive is that you have to design a life support system. Without that, you can really design for maximum aero efficiency. Uh, you don't have to design for a certain height. You don't have to target that uh, a weight for the uh, pilot and the co-pilot. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You can go straight ahead, make it the most aerodynamic thing possible. And that's really created a lot of uh, cool designs. Uh, if you look at the BAE systems designs uh, for the British government in terms of drone craft, they're pretty, uh, pretty out there. And they're pretty cool, but you can get away with it because you don't have to worry about a pilot or a life support system, which is usually fairly bulky and fairly large and takes up a good portion of the cockpit and frontal area of the plane. And there's probably no more uh, relevant use for it in that regard than possible space planes like the XB-70 and such. So, everyone, drones are awesome, and I hope to see you soon. Bye.